Finally, the movie we've all been waiting for, Avatar 2, Avatar The Way of Water, the follow-up to the first Avatar movie from 2009. Now, I liked Avatar well enough when it came out, but it didn't leave that big an impact on me. I feel that's not a particularly controversial opinion. Can you name a single character from the movie Avatar? Um, is that the blue people? But it went to its theatrical re-release earlier this year and remembered, oh yeah, this is actually pretty good. To be sure it has its story issues. Yet there's a certain cinematic alchemy to Avatar. The effects have aged extremely well. It deals in big, sweeping emotions, and I found myself really enjoying the ride it took me on even all these years later. Keep all that in mind when I tell you that I did not enjoy Avatar The Way of Water very much. I mean, I didn't hate the movie, but I did feel tangible relief when I saw the credits start rolling. It opens alright with some good imagery and a quick sequence showing how the past decade and a half or so has progressed for Jake. He has a family now, he's the leader of the tribe, life is good, and I was intrigued to see how things were going to go forward. And then his life, and the movie, take a sharp downwards turn as the humans come back. They, they just land, they're back now. And a year later they have their mining operation up and running again. And then the colonel comes back, you know, Colonel Quaritch. This guy with the two human-length neurotoxin arrows sticking out of his chest. Y yeah, he's back, he's alive again now. Apparently he had downloaded his memories and consciousness into a flash drive so they could create an avatar body for him and send him back to Pandora. Ten minutes in and it feels like the first movie might as well have not happened. And that sets us up to play the same movie all over again. Don't believe me? We have avatars waking up and trashing the lab they're in because they're still getting used to their bodies. We have avatars being dropped off in the jungle for the first time, feeling on edge. We have... Kitty? I think her name is Kitty? Kiri is blessed by the squid seeds of AWOL. Jake has to go to a tribe that's unfamiliar with him, and at first they distrust him but let him stay. There he has to learn their ways and traditions, including learning to ride a creature. In fact, they double dip at the colonel claiming one of the flying mounts from the first movie. Jake's son becomes friends with an outcast version of the mount creatures, the same way Jake got this big super dragon in the first movie. Eventually, the human military comes knocking and they brutalize the local population, burning the village and killing a big sacred nature thing. This music plays as they kill the big sacred nature thing. The locals hate Jake and accuse him of causing all this, but he manages to sway them and leads a big battle against the humans. And yeah, that's about the long and short of this movie. About 90% of its plot beats are identical to the first film. It's like The Force Awakens, except even Star Wars had the courtesy to not resurrect the big bad until the third movie into the reboot. Perhaps the biggest change, the biggest downgrade, is in the stakes. In the first movie, you have this company that wants to mine a super valuable ore deposit. They don't want to look like the bad guys, so they task Jake with negotiating a peaceful departure with the tribe living on the deposit. That said, they also don't mind getting their hands dirty if need be, so there's a limited amount of time before the club starts swinging. The entire society was in danger, those are stakes. Here, Jake just leaves his people behind to hide with the water people and like, the humans don't care. The colonel doesn't give a shit about the ore, he just wants to kill Jake. This entire expedition is being launched just to kill Jake. But why? Is it because he's a symbol for the Na'vi? Take advantage of him being gone and just go for the tree again. It just feels like less is at stake. And these characters aren't strong enough for me to care about their cat and mouse game for three hours, much less for three more movies after this. Now the last 20 minutes or so of this movie really picked up for me. There's this kid who is the colonel's son. And admittedly, he doesn't have a lot to do in the movie except to look on disapprovingly at the evil things his dad does. But there's actually a couple of interesting moments between them in the end that I think serve to humanize the colonel a bit. Which I guess we'll get to watch actually unfold in Avatar 3, maybe. Also, there's a nice scene between Jake and his younger son. Even if we do keep cutting between it and other stuff. Not to mention, not all of Jake's family makes it out alive. So there is some narrative gravity and some narrative movement in this movie. Just not enough for me to feel like 3 hours and 12 minutes of my time were warranted. Honestly, even the effects, touted as the main draw of this movie, didn't really blow my mind. I mean, they were really good. Most of the time. Other times I could pick up the green screen and there's a shark attack sequence that didn't really feel all that convincing. Nothing I was on the level of Black Widow or Thor 4, thank god for that. But 
This movie is extolling itself almost entirely off of its visuals, so it's worth pointing out that I don't think it fully sticks the landing on that front. Admittedly, I just watched this on a regular movie screen. I didn't shell out the money for the 4DX, 3D, RPX screening, so maybe my opinion is irrelevant to James Cameron. Also talking about the effects, I never got used to Kiri's face. Oh my god, she looks so weird. Kiri's supposed to be this important character, like she's really connected to Awa and can communicate with the creatures and have them do things for her. She's the daughter of Sigourney Weaver's character's avatar, but she doesn't know who her father is. It's brought up very pointedly in this movie, but it's not resolved. That's right, we have a female character who's very naturally gifted with this world's spiritual power who doesn't know who her parentage is and it will be revealed in future installments. I wasn't kidding when I said this movie gave me very strong Force Awakens vibes, but at least Rey had like, a fun personality, and a sympathetic origin, and I liked her character, and she looked like a real person instead of whatever this is. I oh, don't know. Maybe this movie was just a victim of my expectations. Honestly, the trailers led me to invent a more interesting version of it in my head. These shots of Navi crushing skulls and walking around construction sites, and the human boy with the arrow, I thought we would get plot elements like some Navi thinking they should adopt human ways to become stronger against future attacks. That could lead to friction with the existing traditions. Maybe some humans were left behind. We could explore how to deal with them, whether they should be integrated, and if so, how. You know, things that move the story forward and ask new questions about this world. Again, I don't hate the movie we got, but after 13 years, the much-hyped sequel to Avatar is a reset to the status quo? I'm sorry to say that I don't think I'm going to be back for Avatar 3 in two years, and I think that's the most damning thing I can say about this movie.